Patrick Bratton, and welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm guest hosting in for Carlos Juarez's normal spot, but have no fear, we are going to be Skyping in Carlos Juarez um, and talking to him today about the migrate, migrant crisis in Europe. So, Carlos, are you there? Oh. Yes, hello, and greetings from tomorrow. I'm calling you uh, Friday morning, uh, I think it's what, 1.30 in the morning here in Romania, and so glad to say hello and look forward to uh, this conversation. Excellent. Good to have you here, even though you're not here, but you're, you're with us virtually. Um, so you said, just to kind of start off to get some context to what we're going to be talking about today. So you are in Romania uh, currently. What are you doing in Romania? Yes. Well, I have come here uh, to participate in an academic conference. Uh, I'm in the provincial city of Craiova. Craiova is in uh, southwestern Romania, near the Bulgarian and Serbian borders. Uh, basically coming to present a paper and, you know, interact with some other academics that are here, most of them from Europe uh, and uh, a few from the U.S. Okay, excellent. Uh, what's the, what are you going to present on? Uh, I'm looking at, a, uh, basically, I presented earlier today a paper that looks at some of the democratic transitions in Central and Eastern Europe, this region of the world, and placing them in a comparative perspective with Latin America, where we've had also a similar process of democratization in the last 20, 30 years. Okay, interesting. I mean, and very topical for what we're going to be uh, talking about today. So, I mean, a lot of our, our viewers here on ThinkTech have been hearing about this, this migrant crisis or this immigration or refugee crisis. Uh, various terms have been used for it in Europe, and it, it seems to be a very complex issue. I was wondering, given your expertise in Europe and the fact that you're there right now talking to people, seeing things at first hand, um, if, if there would be a way that you could kind of summarize uh, the crisis and sort of what's going on and then give our readers a bit of background. Yes. Well, it is today a very serious challenge confronting many of the European countries, and indeed the European Union itself as a whole is this, uh, you know, this project of bringing together and integrating the countries. Uh, we have seen in the last few months in particular a really serious crisis, unprecedented, the largest migration of people since World War II. Uh, the numbers are quite staggering, tens of thousands that are flowing every day, hundreds of thousands in the past year, uh, and it is a flow that has not stopped. And uh, as we will see, uh, we'll look in a few moments at some maps, uh, we have seen a steady flow particularly coming now from Syria in the Middle East, from Iraq and Afghanistan, the largest group, however, from Syria, uh, given the crisis that's unfolding there. And uh, so on one hand, these migrants are being pushed out because of the you know, war situation, the civil war conflict. Uh, and when we look at migration, we always have to understand that it has usually a, a, a push and a pull factor. The push factor is that they are basically leaving a, a difficult situation back home uh, but there's another side, which is the pull factor, and that is Europe uh, is a part of the world that has a need for immigrants, and, and there is a shortage of workers, especially in Northern Europe, and so there are opportunities that obviously draw them. Moreover, there's a long history of immigration that, you know, we have large communities, especially in places like Germany and Sweden, where is the source of many of the, or the place where most of them are trying to go to right now. Uh, we have really seen the situation has gotten quite desperate because right now we're beginning to enter into the, you know, colder months and uh, we're seeing just a, a humanitarian crisis that's really unprecedented. Uh, it's been quite dramatic uh, and as we'll talk a little bit more, it's put a real challenge on some of these countries in, in many different ways. Well, we've just put up a map, uh, Carlos, uh, of, yes. the, of the migrant routes into Europe. I was wondering if you could kind of walk our, our viewers a little bit through this. Yeah, and I think what you see here now is basically uh, it shows you, again, coming from the Middle East, uh, the trajectory takes most of these migrants are coming through Turkey initially. Many of them are getting onto boats, very perilous, very dangerous, finding their way into Greece. And then from there, a long journey that takes them through many countries. And uh, what we see in this particular map is this is the main migrant route. And what has happened in the last few weeks especially has been some of the countries, beginning with Hungary, but also now uh, countries like uh, Croatia, even Slovenia, they're beginning to have such a challenge that they are putting up borders and fences. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, important to note because the European Union, where, you know, many of these countries belong to, essentially have an open-door policy. Once you enter into this zone, uh, what they call the Schengen uh, region, uh, you know, the borders are basically gone and you can move freely. Well, with this crisis now, we've begun to see some of the governments are responding by trying to divert or, or limit 
the flow, uh, and it's presenting a real challenge for many of the governments. Right. Uh, you have mentioned the Schengen borders. I do believe we have a, another another map uh, that we can show our viewers that looks at which are the Schengen uh, agreement countries, because not everybody in the European Union is a part yes. of this uh, agreement. Uh, That's right. And and I think if you look at this map, actually it does show Romania is the, I believe it's in a like a uh, purple color, and it is part of the EU, but it is not part of this Schengen agreement. And what the Schengen agreement basically means is all those countries that form it basically become part of this cohesive group that once you're inside that zone, uh, today you have no, you know, you don't even need to use your passports anymore if you're crossing from Hungary to Austria, Germany to France. Basically the borders are open. And instead, the outer perimeter of this Schengen zone is the effective border of the European Union. Now, Bulgaria and Romania, these are two countries that are not in the Schengen, but they are part of the EU, so it just speaks to they're a little bit, you know, latecomers to, to the, you know, European Union as well. The same with Croatia. That's the other, the newest member that joined the European Union in 2013. They are not part of the Schengen today. Uh, and then you see the map that shows you the green countries. These are in the Balkans region, the former Yugoslavia, and those are not part of the, either the EU or Schengen, but they are part of the transit. This is where the migrants are heading, basically heading north, mostly towards Germany and Sweden. Right. Um, you mentioned earlier about the border uh, fences that countries are, are, are creating. So as we saw on the map, you've got some countries that have built up these border fences sort of on the, on the non-Schengen area. Um, but I was reading today that there's some controversy about I think Austria is looking to create a border fence with Slovenia, and those are both Schengen uh, countries. Yes. I mean, so I imagine that's going to create quite, um, in addition to the general crisis, if you will, perhaps a crisis in relations amongst Schengen member uh, states as well. Indeed, and think, I think what this crisis is really beginning to bring out is a lot of tension. Uh, the countries are all trying to handle this flow in a way that is responding both to domestic pressure, because there's a lot of concern about that, but also even the idea of, you know, how do you divert them? Do you want them coming through here, or do you want to send them that way? Uh, the real story began a few weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, with the country of Hungary literally going out and putting up a fence and, and constructing a, a fence, which is now in place with their border in, with Serbia. And the result is that now the migrants have had to kind of turn left and go more to the west, uh, a little country like Slovenia that, you know, both you and I have had opportunities to go and visit and, and, you know, we've hosted visitors from there. You know, here's a country that has a small population of 2 million, and just this past 10 days, they've suddenly had 80,000 of these migrants passing through their border, and they have been overwhelmed. Uh, but I think what this crisis also shows is, you know, the tensions are flaring up between these countries, and it, also in a curious way, you also see different personalities. And for example, in Hungary, they are led, uh, the last five years, they have a very, uh, a very, let's say, authoritarian regime. Uh, the current prime minister has, has taken some pretty tough stands, and he's angered a lot of the other countries. And we saw in some of the news coverage, there was a lot of mistreatment of some of the migrants, kind of, you know, beating them up and, you know, forcing them to go, you know, extended periods. By contrast, when they got into Austria or even Germany, you would see them welcomed by people, helping them, giving them free food and clothes. So I, I find it interesting that, you know, you kind of see some of the personalities of different countries coming out, but most definitely tensions are, are quite there. Uh, this is a problem that has to be addressed by the, you know, the collective countries and the European Union, which, you know, brings together 28 member, member states, is designed to help facilitate, you know, cooperation, coordination. It is proving to be very, very difficult for them. One of the things you mentioned is the differences the, in, in the countries, and I've seen some news reportage over the past couple of weeks, and one of the strong correlations uh, people have offered for how the, 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 the migrants have been treated coming in depends a lot on the socioeconomic sort of situations in the country. So, you know, unlike a lot of other Western developed countries, Germany's done pretty well through this, these sort of turbulent economic years. It's got a very robust export-oriented uh, economy, yet it doesn't have a lot of workers. There's not enough sort of Germans, if you will, to fill all the working posts. So perhaps Germany is a little bit more open, perhaps, to getting migrants to come in and work, where some of these countries, Hungary, that you've mentioned, some of the other ones, you know, the, Greece in particular, as we well know from other uh, European news, is, you know, the economy is, shall we say, not in the best case, uh, best shape. And so there's, you know, perhaps this drives um, 
both uh, unwillingness in the countries to host them, but perhaps also gives rise to some of these politicians that you've mentioned, like in Hungary, a more sort of nativist or perhaps anti-migrant or anti-immigration uh, sentiment in the country uh, as well. Is that sort of your observation as you're looking at? Absolutely. Now, of course, you have countries like you mentioned, Greece, and even, even places like, uh, uh, for example, Serbia, even Slovenia, the migrants are generally not wanting to go there. They're making their way farther north where the pull is to the economies of Germany uh, and also Sweden. And those are countries that have both large populations already, but they have also a need. And, and indeed, they have, uh, you know, in some ways, that's what's pulling them up there. Uh, but like you said, there are some real tensions. There's a lot of, uh, you know, disenchantment. Um, what we have also seen is a rise in uh, support for right-wing anti-immigrant groups. And just uh, this past weekend, a very important election in the country of Poland mm. has, brought, has brought to power now a, a very right-wing government. Now, in that election, immigration was not the main thing. It had more to do with economic issues. But it does underscore, again, a growing uh, disenchantment, difficulty, because Anytime you have economic woes, we have it in the U.S. Whenever there's a tough time, immigrants become a very easy scapegoat. Uh, and yet the, the reality is that immigrants are one of the lifebloods of these economies. And places like Germany, they absolutely need them. And in fact, they are welcoming them. They also have infrastructure and they have large communities that can help, you know, in some ways manage more the inflow, although not without its own tensions. But, hmm. but most certainly much easier than in other places where they're not as welcome. Mm. I think we have a, a third map about asylum claims. Uh, I just wanted to, we'll put this up. I mean, again, we can see some of the things that you've indicated. It looks like Germany is receiving a lot of the uh, yes. a lot of these claims. Could you maybe speak to this math as well? Yeah, you know, again, this is what you see uh, some data that tells us, you know, what are the number of claims? Uh, and it, just in this past year alone, one half a million, five hundred and thirty thousand uh, over that number uh, of of asylum claims. And again, these are people that making their way up there, are seeking opportunities. Germany is the single largest. It is the largest economy in the region. It is, you know, the powerhouse, uh, but it's also the one that depends most on migrant workers. Uh, farther up, you have uh, Sweden as well. Hungary is, a, you know, as well noted here, is a pretty significant one, uh, but that's one of the countries we've seen really with a lot of tensions and, and, and you know, sort of a more negative uh, picture. So I think what this crisis has shown us is on one hand, the ugliest part of Europe uh, in the sense of, you know, a very strong reaction against them, but also some of the best. We've seen, you know, dramatic stories of people welcoming them, helping them, you know, giving them clothing and, and food, uh, because it is a very serious humanitarian crisis. I mean, right now, most of these immigrants coming from the Middle East, um, they, are, they are also, in many cases, very well educated, very skilled, uh, and they are coming because their circumstance back home, especially in Syria, has been so difficult that they've decided to make this long trek. And, and it's quite a treacherous journey. Now, I mean, it takes them weeks to get up. Uh, it costs a lot of money. They have to pay along the way. As you can imagine, there's a whole growth industry of people who are both taking advantage of this, uh, you know, everything from, you know, selling them cell phones along the way, but mostly transportation, you know, taking them by cars and bus, mostly by train. Uh, so it's a very complex issue, and it's really... I think in many ways it is challenging the European Union countries to address this because uh, while they are designed as a European Union you know, entity to solve these issues collectively, this has proven very difficult and a lot of tensions have flared up. All right. Well, we're going to take a small break here and we'll get back to particularly kind of your segue about talking about future so solutions and challenges for the European Union. Yes. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is our flagship show, which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. And the, uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important, and there's so many developments happening across the state. And we hope you'll tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. Wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? 
Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon uh, that uh, we are talking about every Wednesday, 4 to 5, uh, we talk about some of the most important subjects that uh, are affecting the islands uh, now and into the future. Uh, energy, clean energy, we need it. Uh, we often run into uh, new ideas that we had not uh, thought about before. Uh, we did just today, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think we're going to have more of that uh, in the future. So uh, come on down and, uh, and watch us uh, 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, um, and we'll uh, see what happens. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. Hello, and welcome back to Global Connections on ThinkTech Y. I'm Patrick Bratton, uh, talking with Carlos Juarez, who's in Romania, and we're going through a lot of the ramifications and importance of the large migrant crisis in the European Union. Now, before we cut to our, our break, uh, we were overviewing a lot of the migrant routes, where these people are coming from, where they're going in Europe, and a lot of the issues that are confronting. And we've touched a little bit upon some of the reactions of some of the different uh, European countries as well. So maybe we'll stay there for a second and then talk uh, about sort of larger sort of EU-wide sort of responses and options after. I mean, one thing I think is interesting with Germany is that, as you've mentioned, uh, Angela Merkel has sort of taken this bold stance and sort of try, uh, welcoming, the, uh, welcoming a lot of these migrants into Germany. Um, and because of the German economy, has done quite well in the past couple of years. Uh, but then, you know, there are some critics who have been uh, raising the issue. If you look at sort of German history, right, when the wall came down, Germany unified, Germany sort of opened its arms up to all of these sort of ethnic Germans who were in the Eastern Bloc, Soviet Union, to come in. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of people came in. And uh, that kind of surprised sort of the German state of how it's supposed to integrate uh, all mm -hmm. of these new citizens into Germany. And some people have said, you know, it's one of the reasons the German economy slowed down, you know, sort of in the 1990s and tried absorbing both East Germany and then all of these other uh, uh, groups coming in. So in, in a sense, is this a very risky move for Merkel, both politically? I mean, she's been around yeah. already for a decade. I know Germans like to have their chancellors around for a long time, as Helmut Kohl and Adenauer show us. Um, but is it both politically risky for Merkel and also economically, is it risky for Germany in terms of uh, bringing in these people uh, and then trying to integrate them into society and then opening up sort of social benefits and things to them? Well, no doubt there are some real risks. I mean, on, and yet it's a very clear divide. I mean, on the one hand, there's a real need and a pull. Uh, not enough German teenagers and young, you know, workers for the factories. Uh, and so they need migrant workers. Uh, especially, you know, those that can be working in skilled positions. Uh, but the challenge is that, you know, inevitably when you have, is, and, and, and at this point the scale is so large that it's going to create some challenges. They simply cannot process enough uh, because while they need them, they need them in a way that they can manage the flow and make sure to direct them in the right places. And Germany, of course, because of its capacity and maybe long experience working with migrants, does have a system, you know, where they integrate them more effectively, Moreover, there are critical masses of, of, you know, other, especially Arab communities, Greek communities that came before. Uh, and that's different than in other countries that don't have as much experience. Uh, so while Germany has the experience, the scale that we're seeing right now is so large that there is no doubt they will be facing some challenges. Inevitably, when you have large groups of people, you know, it, it's going to present, you know, it, it's going to give a rise to sort of this nativist uh, populist sentiment that we, we can't do it. And... I think a lot of the dialogue I'm hearing now is that, you know, while they have to stem the flow, they have to deal with, you know, those that are coming, there's also a critical need to go to the source and find out, you know, what can we do to stop the flow? And that, that might mean, you know, providing more support as they are doing for Turkey, where many of those are at the border, you know, can, can they provide, are they better off giving them money to keep them there until they can process them more carefully? Uh, or does it mean that we have to put more energy into trying to solve the crisis in Syria so we don't have a continual flow of that? And, of course, that is an issue that's been ratcheted up right now, the discussions going on in Vienna, Austria, that are bringing together you know, to try and address you know, the crisis in Syria, which is right now a major source of many of these. Uh, in the end, it's such a complicated issue, so many little pieces at the same time. There's no easy solution. And I think the real challenge we see it is really putting a, a challenge on the European Union as a, you know, as a, as a single entity. Can it manage this? Can it coordinate this? Uh, it's proving to be quite, quite a challenge. And uh, you know, many countries are now questioning even the idea of the open borders because 
the whole experiment of the European Union was to create this large single market, uh, which it has. But now you have a lot of reaction. Governments are now wanting to impose new border restrictions, and that goes against the whole idea. So it's a real, real test of, of the European Union. Would you say, I mean, the, these two twin crises that are going on for the EU, both the Euro crisis, you know, bringing in Greece and a couple of other countries, uh, uh, and then again now this migrant crisis, which again involves sort of the similar group of countries uh, with perhaps similar divides between them. Would these two sort of cr simultaneous crises, do they have a synergistic effect in the sense of being even worse for the EU, or does perhaps with a crisis, two different crises, does this provide opportunities for collaboration perhaps with people that might be divided on one crisis but might find common ground on the other? Or is it just sort of, it makes things even worse, if you will? Uh, I think the latter. I think uh, this is really presenting a real crisis for the European Union. There is a sense of frustration and that difficulty in reaching, you know, because for many, many years, indeed decades, what brought together the European countries was this sense of, you know, shared uh, values, shared even identity, and really solving things multilaterally, the, you know, indeed, long before the European Union, they really have centuries of multilateralism uh, as a way of, you know, taking care of things. Well, uh, today, uh, we are seeing really the biggest crisis confronting the European Union, an inability to, to really come to consensus on this. Uh, and even the idea presented a few weeks ago, a, a, you know, a formula of giving countries very specific quotas that they must accept, you know, so many, that is not going over very well, and you have many countries rejecting that. Uh, there are many countries that simply don't want to be forced. Uh, they want to leave it to those who are, you know, willing. The other side is that it, it is clearly much like the Eurozone crisis you mentioned, which is the currency crisis that Greece uh, faced uh, earlier this year. Because of the interdependence of all of these economies, they really have no choice but to try and solve it collectively. In other words, they, they are interdependent in a way that they cannot neglect it. Uh, and this crisis, for example, it affects the countries differently. Those at the entry level, whether it's, you know, Italy, you know, for many of those boats that we saw earlier in the spring and summer, today it's Greece and even Turkey. Turkey is not a member of the EU, but it is very much integrated into the region. Uh, the European Union today is providing a lot of funding to Turkey as part of the solution to try and help have them help process it more carefully. But this is by any measure a real, real crisis and a test for the Europeans and their ability to try to you know, bring a collective prob uh, sol solution to this. It is not proving to be easy. Uh, so I think we're going to continue to see real challenges here. Um, maybe going back down to the local level, taking advantage of where you are, I mean, what are some of your thoughts looking at sort of Romanian TV interacting with people on the ground in the conference? I mean, what's sort of, what's sort of a, if you will, kind of a Romanian perspective or what's the viewpoint there? Yeah, and interesting, you know, I'm here very close to where all of this is happening. However, <coughs> the migrants aren't really coming in through Romania. The Romania is like the last place they want to go to. There's not really many opportunities. Uh, they're trying to... Um, I think we. What I've seen here is some interesting sentiment is that you know some people are looking at different countries in different ways. And for example, the government in Hungary, just to the north, has been criticized for a very harsh, you know, uh, uh, position towards the migrants. But I have heard some sentiment saying, "Well, no, they're bold. They're you know they're they're very decisive, and almost like seeing them with some uh, uh, almost you know sort of." Uh, admiration that you know they're they're very decisive whereas their leaders here are indecisive and can't you know take these bold moves there's a lot of different sentiment I would say but of course it's different if you're not facing it here I mean Romania is not having that crisis in front of them at the moment that could change but right now they don't see it uh, and as long as you have like an escape valve if the problem goes elsewhere people are not going to feel the same way where we have that happening, and in just in the last two weeks, uh, places like Croatia and Slovenia, they had not had a problem. Now they are facing a tremendous challenge, and that has given rise to a lot of, uh, you know, public sentiment. We got to do something, or we, you know, we have to. Uh, uh, the tensions are very high, I, I must say, and uh, uh, the solutions are just not very easy to find. 
if you're if you're kind of looking at the the European institutions and the interplay with local politics, I mean, one of the criticisms people often make of the European Union is the quote unquote you know democratic deficit, and so a lot of people don't really sort of care about European elections to the European Parliament and things like that. And so what often you have in European countries is that people elect sort of far left-wing or far right-wing people who are sort of intrinsically anti-European, ironically, to represent those countries at the European Union. Um, has this crisis uh, at sort of at the level of the e European Parliament, this has also sort of inflamed or emboldened a lot of these sort of extremist sort of views that tend to be both anti-EU, uh, and most of those groups that are anti-EU also tend to be sort of anti-immigrant or anti-migrant, uh, if you will. Is that is sort of compounding this general tendency, would you say? Yeah, I do. I think so. And of course, one of the ironies is that some of those who are you know, very staunchly anti-EU are in the parliament and happily collecting their EU paychecks every right. two weeks. Uh, but more to the point, I think what you do see is, as you described, I mean, it tends to give rise to sort of extremist views in both ways, on the far right, perhaps anti-immigrant, but even on the other side, many who are pushing for, you know, a need to address the social and, you know, justice issues. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, the election this past weekend in Poland. I think it's a signal of how, you know, the rise of these right-wing parties is going to be with us for some time. We've had in the last year or two significant elections in Sweden that have given also a rise to, you know, even, you know, and Sweden is a country with a very high percentage of foreign, you know, population and a large community of immigrants. And many of them do support it. I mean, it's, it's got a very strong, you know, pro-immigrant uh, sentiment, but it has also given rise to this other side of a more anti-immigrant. So we're seeing a real clash. Uh, the other thing I think it's bringing out is, while the experiment of the European Union has, you know, gradually it's moved a lot of countries together on many issues, and today most EU members, states, or citizens of the EU are governed by EU laws, this has actually brought out a lot more domestic level sentiment, a lot more. Uh, but I think the other thing I would add, what you also have is a real disconnect between the elites and the leaders who are, you know, part of this EU, let's say, uh, governing, you know, coalition, and many of the populations who feel disconnected, like they're not really being well represented. And I think that's been a challenge for the EU on many issues. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, they tried to pass a constitution. They couldn't do it. Uh, I think there's a real disconnect between the elites, especially the, the sort of EU bureaucrats and the populations that often feel that uh, their interests are not being represented. Mm. Well, quite a, again, quite a, a, a sort of a vexing crisis with no easy solutions. I was wondering maybe in passing as we, as we wrap up, I mean, are there any either sort of proposed solutions in the air or things that might be floated that we should, our viewers should sure be looking out for over the next couple of weeks? Well, the, you know, the leaders have continued to come together just in the past few days, you know, another crisis meeting in Brussels to try to address this. I mean, it's an ongoing thing. And, uh, you know, uh, it's one of these things that there's no simple answer and there's no solution that's going to satisfy everybody. Moreover, the European Union is a you know, collection of 28 member states, but not all of them are affected in the same way. You know, the Baltics in the north, you know, Ireland, uh, you know, maybe Spain and Portugal, they're not right now, you know, affected by this in the same way that Central Europe is and, you know, Northern Europe. So there's a, you know, there's not a clear consensus. Uh, but more to the point, I think it's bringing out some of the ugliest parts of it. Uh, but on the other hand, they are trying, you know, as they always do, you know, more meetings, more symmetry. Um, and, you know, this is a very busy time uh, for them. Uh, no easy answers, uh, and, and yet it is a real test of whether they'll be able to overcome this, this crisis. Um. Yeah, quite, quite, uh, quite a difficult situation. Well, we've run out of time here on Global Connections. It's good to have you here from Romania. I was wondering if you, I forget the name of the dish, but if there's this wonderful stuffed cabbage with sour, sour cream dish that I love yes. from Romanian food. So if you could have some of that for me, I would appreciate it. Uh, well and, Thank you. And hopefully uh, we will see you again in the future, either yes. back here or on Skype. And uh, yes. with that, thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you. Aloha.